Oh no. <laughs> Excellent. I will keep my inappropriate comments to a minimum. Can't say zero because it's not possible. All right. Um, so now for something totally different. I have a very different worldview than uh, what Anton presented. So I'll, I'll try and orient you and maybe call this the 10 second version of uh, how computational condensed matter physics thinks. Okay. So I, I want to present a first principles perspective of how we can compute properties of topological systems. And I'll primarily focus on Dirac and Val systems, but um, I'll hopefully convince you that these, these uh, methods are fairly general. And um, I collaborate fairly closely with a whole bunch of people, including uh, someone who's here in the audience, Mike Hopkins, but also an experimentalist, Claudia Falser, some of you might know her, Amir Kobe, Ken Birch, uh, Shannon Wei Fan, and others, which should give you kind of an idea that we think about experiments that are not just uh, <coughs> transport, not just uh, optical measurements, but, but kind of a, a wide spectrum. And of course, also working closely with theorists. All right, and maybe this will work. So I think Dirac and Val systems are, are very, a very rich area of physics. And they've, uh, of course, led to interesting discoveries. There are many phases. We can think about these in many different ways. And, and in, my, in my view of this, I, I start out by thinking, OK, I understand graphene. I understand has this uh, nice dark point. I understand what, how I can predict the optical properties of graphene. I can understand transport in graphene to some degree. Well, all semi-metals have a fair bit in common with graphene in terms of how we predict uh, some of these systems. There's behavior that is right around the nodes. There's, of course, many, many more uh, opportunities for scattering. But in some ways, um, you can also move the nodes. You can think about strain tuning as these. And, and to, to me, strain is you pull on it, you compress it. Okay, So very, very uh, rudimentary view of strain. Um, same idea for how we think about scattering in these systems. Uh, we think about scattering that is uh, determined by the chemical potential. These nodes are not uh, always isolated. So how do, how do they exist in the context of the other electronic structure of the system? There are some interesting questions associated with the non-equilibrium response to these. So I can think about shining light in these that is uh, uh, maybe something that resembles more uh, like the, the light here. But I can also think about hitting these with a giant laser. And the, those two regimes are fairly different. And how we compute those two regimes is very different. And I, I won't really talk about any of the, the work in the Floquet or uh, the axion insulator physics, but there are many in the audience who probably uh, think about this. Okay. I keep trying to click this, and it doesn't work. Okay. So part of where these effects emerge from in the electronic structure really comes down to the fact that there is strong spin-orbit coupling in these systems. Okay, And this has been very... You know, it's been talked about a lot in, in the context of topological insulators, so I won't dwell on that. But say that some of that same physics is relevant to vial and direct semi-metals. But that's not it. There's more to it, and understanding these systems is, is not directly extending uh, some of the behavior that's seen with topological insulators. And you, you can't just say, well, now the gap goes away and everything else it kind of remains the same. There are different effects that become important. Part of what is exciting about these topological uh, crystals, and in particular the violent direct semi-metals, is that under excitation they do really extreme things. And um, this shows up in the context of like matter interactions. Turns out that you know the search for for thinking about new nonlinear materials, and uh, most of these systems are inherently nonlinear, and that's not not something that is easy for us to accomplish with conventional systems. They all seem to have a very strong response to electric and magnetic fields and interesting temperature response. And predicting um, the, the quantities that then go into uh, these descriptions is, is what we are focusing on. I'll give you two examples of it. I won't try and cover um, everything that is shown here, but just say that, let's think about transport in ballast semi-metals. Let's think about light matter interactions in ballast semi-metals, and how the, the methods with those two are, are fairly similar. Uh, so I get this question a lot. Why do we need uh, first principles computation? Why, why can't we just? Uh, um, you know, take, take something that is analytic, and, and why do we need to think about more than just uh, the Duval point? Right. So it turns out that uh, these vast semi-metals have very complicated band structures. So there's something that you can say that is right, you know, um, and near the nose. Maybe you can say something right where the, the band touchings are. But there, that is embedded in a larger electronic structure of the system, which also impacts the behavior of these materials. Uh, this is my, my way of saying that if this is all you included in a calculation, you'd end up with a qualitatively and a quantitatively different result from what is seen in an experiment. 
And therefore, uh, we think about computing the entire electronic structure of these systems. So these are just examples of some of the systems we've looked at. Uh, there's, of course, a whole host of uh, uh, these that, that you can predict. Okay. And often when I talk about how do we predict these systems, I get this question, great, so insert acronym here. Right? Maybe you're, you're thinking it's some, something density function theory, maybe something GW, maybe something something that's up here equation. That's not quite the case. We think about these diagrammatically, which is to say that in some of these systems, it's important for us to treat things beyond density function theory. Uh, we need to think about interactions that are, include electron-electron scattering, electron-phonon scattering, and photon-phonon scattering, in addition to coupling to the photon. And as I've listed those, you're probably thinking, gee, this is a very computationally uh, challenging problem. And yes, that's true. And I, I don't claim to do back-of-the-envelope calculations. In fact, my envelope looks a little bit like this. Uh, this is a giant uh, GPU cluster that we use in order to actually uh, compute the properties of the, the systems I'm talking about. All right, transport. So I got interested in this system because there were experiments that were coming out maybe a couple years ago now. I, I still call these recent where they were showing signatures of hydrodynamic transport in these materials. And hydrodynamic transport has been seen in graphene. And I thought to myself, well, these systems look very different from graphene. And yet, they seem to have that same width-dependent resistivity. Right? So, so it looks like um, current in these systems is like water flowing through a pipe. Uh, for those of you who think about phonon hydrodynamics, I'm going to now talk about electron hydrodynamics. But I will do a little slide of, uh, hand at some point and say there's an electron phonon component. And at that point, you can ask me uh, some questions about why, why phonon hydrodynamics and electron hydrodynamics are different. OK, so this looks very different from uh, the, the conventional ohmic transport you'd expect in most uh, solid state systems. right? So it's kind of different from what uh, we learned, say, in Ashcroft Merman. And what I find interesting is that you see these effects not only in simple systems, but actually some of these very, very uh, complicated crystal structures. So I'll focus in my talk on toxin phosphide, but everything I'll show you also generalizes to um, platinum tinnate and some of the other uh, materials that exhibit uh, hydrodynamic behavior. Something else that's unusual about these same systems, and this is really getting to the heart of the fact that the transport behavior of all semi-metals is not only different, not only kind of anomalous, very uh, different from uh, conventional uh, systems, and it's also a diagnostic of some of the biophysics in, um, in these systems. So they violate the Wiedemann Franz law, and um, for those of you thinking, well, everything violates the Wiedemann Franz law a little bit, so you expect the Lorentz ratio to essentially be flat across the temperature range. Uh, as these, these curves here, as you can see, don't look flat across the temperature range. Um, so yes, all semiconductors, to some degree, violate the Wiedemann Franz law. It's the fact that these have a strong violation of the Wiedemann Franz law, and it seems like the violation of the Wiedemann Franz law is exactly where they exhibit hydrodynamic transport. So that's kind of confusing because you expect a violation of the Wiedemann Franz law, which um, could come from phonons doing more of the work in carrying uh, the, the energy in the system, uh, to be in say say closer to maybe um, harder k. It's, it's not where you would expect it to exactly overlap with the hydrodynamic regime, where you're saying that it's also electron hydrodynamics, right? So those two things don't go together. Well, one side you're saying that the, um, the, the electrons are uh, in this nice phase front, you see Pazel flow. At the same time, you're saying that the phonons are carrying more of the energy. That's kind of uh, counterintuitive. So that's where we said, OK, uh, one of the, the ways we can think about this is to just calculate everything about the material, in particular, think about the scattering properties. Uh, what we should see is that there's a separation of time scales. So we should be able to say that the electron-electron times, for example, are very different from the electron-phonon scattering times. And maybe that will allow us to establish whether uh, the, the electron hydrodynamics is truly electron hydrodynamics. And if um, the, the phonons are carrying more energy than they should, that's something that should show up in a temperature-dependent scattering calculation. In order to do a temperature-dependent scattering calculation, you need to set up a uh, system. So I, I told you I'll pick tungsten phosphide. It's it's a nice system because it's, um, it has this very, it's, it's low symmetry, but it has a single plane that is the obvious plane in which transport occurs, so you don't see any out-of-plane transport effects. So it can look like a quasi-2D system is what I'm saying. It's a type 2 vial semi-metal, so uh, we're able to find the, the vial points. And what we also wanted to diagnose is what is the contribution of the vial points to the transport in the system. And again, that's something that having the full scattering matrix allows you to do. OK. So we calculate the, the lifetime term first principles as a function of temperature. And we break it down into three or four different components. This is important. 
Okay? So I can look at just the electron electron time. I can look at the electron phonon time. I can also bin these as saying there are some lifetimes that are momentum conserving and there are some that are momentum relaxing. Right? So why would I care about momentum relaxing versus momentum conserving? Well, momentum conserving would allow me to see this nice hydrodynamic transport. Anything that is momentum relaxing would actually scramble things. So it would mess things up. Right? The, in, in conventional transport, you see a combination of those two. And eventually, the momentum relaxing is the, the more dominant effect. And therefore, you don't see this nice phase front in every material that you do a transport measurement on. OK, so we started to do that. And what we realized is that, so if you expected it to be purely electron hydrodynamics, the temperature dependent scattering of these systems should be described by the electron electron time. That should be it. Everything else should have a different, um, say, a different temperature dependence. Maybe it should be even a different order of magnitude. What we consistently saw is that there's an electron electron term that normally is not considered, but it's an electron electron term that is mediated by a virtual phonon that best describes the temperature dependent scattering in these systems, particularly in the hydrodynamic regime. And this led us to think, gee, maybe this can help us understand why it's violating the Wiedemann Franz law and showing hydrodynamics simultaneously. And we also characterized the small angle scattering, and, and these, the experimental numbers here are from uh, as someone who works with uh, Claudia Peltz, so we wanted to actually compare quantitatively what we were predicting with uh, their experiment. Turns out that we, we see excellent agreement. Okay, so the uh, inverted orange things here are experiment. They don't have experiment at pretty much every temperature. I, I told them, hey, could you do a more a dense sampling? And they're like, you know, an experiment is not dense sampling. You actually have to, somebody has to go spend dozens of hours. So these, are life, these are transport lifetimes computed from the Boltzmann equation? Uh, these transport lifetimes are uh, computed using uh, the ab initio scattering matrices. In order to get the transport coefficients, we put them in a Boltzmann transport equation. So but the lifetimes themselves... They're not single particle. I'm sorry? They're not single particle lifetimes. They're transport lifetimes. That's right. Yeah, okay. yeah. These are transport lifetimes. Um, at the moment, the, there's no spatial component here. I'll, I'll get to that here in a, a second where we actually put them into a, a spatially resolved uh, Boltzmann solver in order to see that, um, that um, hydrodynamic phase front appear. Okay, so uh, we were interested by this because we then realized that this electron-electron time that is virtual phonon mediated could allow you to have this uh, momentum-conserving behavior while still exchanging energy between the electron and the phonon subsystem and do that at the same time scale as, um, as the scattering process that's dominating the transport, as uh, Subir's question um, indicated. Okay, so... Um, this is how we compute the, the electron electron time that I just uh, showed you. And uh, these are done within um, RPA. There's no reason it has to be within RPA. This was just uh, for computational um, convenience for us. And we get essentially the, the entire component of the imaginary part, uh, which would be the, the lifetime determining component of uh, a scattering matrix here. Okay. This can go into our nice uh, our, our transport um, equation formalism, in particular to get the electrical conductivity. Okay, so early on we were still thinking, well, this must be a mistake. This electron-electron time mediated by virtual phonon must be something weird going on. Let's see if we can diagnose it via a transport coefficient. We are now confident that what we are seeing is not an electron fluid as much as it is an electron phonon fluid, and and we're we can we can talk about how the hydrodynamic equation should be generalized to to include that. All right, so after we did all of this, I got a, a fairly mundane question. Hey, can you compute the same times for like a simple material that many of us would have interacted with, like say copper, and do you see something different? And we were like, sure, we're happy to do that. And actually it turns out that this uh, electron-electron time that is uh, phonon mediated is absolutely mundane for, for copper, but turns out to be very important for this volatile semi-metal. And this is important to, to kind of notice that semi-metals have a lot in common with metals, but ever so often they do things that are very different from metals. And, and this might be an obvious statement to, to people, but um, diagnosing that from a computational sample was exciting to us. We also wanted to think about the, the electron-phonon coupling going beyond leading order. And this is, again, to say that maybe there is something about the electron-phonon fluid that has been missed in conventional uh, condensed matter descriptions. And if so, how would we go about uh, computing that? So this is uh, a part, part of this set of diagrams that we uh, include for the electron self-energy that is calculated from this electron-phonon uh, coupling. We also calculate the inverse process, which is the phonon-electron 
uh, coupling, which is, so you can think about how the electrons stress the phonons. You also think about how the phonons impact the electrons. We calculate both of those in order to get uh, the transport behavior. And this plot on the left it made me really, really, really happy when I saw it. So the solid line here is the theory. The, the x's there are uh, the experiment. There's no fitting parameter. There's no fudge parameter. There's no adjustment. Any of those words that you might have uh, uh, previously encountered in theorists comparing to experiment, there's none of that. Okay? Something was computed. Something was measured. They were overlaid. And they lined up really, really well. And so we were really encouraged by this because we, th we thought, OK, uh, the, the way that we're describing transport and valid metals, yes, I've only shown you one material so far, but uh, trust me that it actually works for some other systems as well, uh, is in fact a quantitative description of these uh, there's no impurities here. Just no, there's no impurities. And actually, that's something that's really exciting about hydrodynamic transport, is that it seems very resilient to the presence of impurities. So if you um, look at some of the um, you know, electron microscopy data on the samples grown by Claudia and others, they, they have impurities. It just seems like the, the hydrodynamic transport is completely unaffected by that. Uh, we are working to characterize how the electron impurity scattering um, would change uh, some of these lifetimes, but to at least leading order, it seems like it's, it's uh, fairly resilient to it. At extremely low temperatures, the impurity scattering starts to dominate. So if you go to, um, say, somewhere between 1 to the 5 Kelvin uh, regime, then you start to see that it, it really picks up. Okay, so I know I'm going to soon run out of time, but I'll, I'll just say that we, we looked at the family surfaces for these, and now we're, we're trying to figure out what is, um, from a really microscopic perspective, the source of the vitamin front violation. Right? So we can do the lifetime calculations. We can resolve them uh, over a family surface. We can do them as a function of temperature. That still doesn't give you the answer. What are the states that are contributing to this violation of vitamin front And that's what we're getting at. So just to be candid about what we know and what we don't know. All right, so I, I talked about the vitamin front and then the final step in, in looking at where the violation of vitamin front law comes from would be to then do the thermal conductivity prediction and just do that ratio, right? It's very simple. Uh, and I, I should see that dip. And as we started doing that, we realized that to, to compute the thermal conductivity of these systems, you think about the phonon self-energies, but also think about phonon-phonon interactions that are um, beyond the typical um, lowest order phonon-phonon interactions. So something that uh, it's, it's one of those rabbit holes where it said all we have to do is x, and then um, we're now looking at three and four phonon processes and how uh, they change the thermal conductivity in valve seven metals. So there's a take home that you want to uh, get from this, this part of my talk. It should be that transport in valve seven metals is exciting. Um, it's hard to compute, but we're getting there. And that leading order is not only insufficient, but it gives you kind of qualitatively the incorrect answer. If you walk away with that, I'm happy. Okay. Um, real quick, do I have like two minutes? Okay, awesome. Uh, so I want to talk about light matter interactions in valve semi-metals because um, I think that the optical response to these systems is almost as exciting as their, um, as their transport behavior, if not more. So type 1 semi-metals, uh, tantalum, niobium, arsenide, and there are others, they seem to have a very strong nonlinear um, optical uh, response. And this is um, Exciting because the number of nonlinear optical materials that we know of, I can probably list on, on like one hand, right? So that's, that's not great. And most people who are, who are thinking about optical physics and people who are thinking about devices often say it would be great if we had a nonlinear material in regime X. And it uh, turns out that valve semi-metals are, are naturally highly uh, nonlinear. In fact, they now hold the record for second harmonic generation, uh, surpassing gallium arsenide by about 200x. Okay, there was some resonant effect here, but... Um, it's, it's still pretty awesome that uh, gallium arsenide that had set the standard for decades was so easily surpassed by this material. And what was even more uh, interesting to us was that they start to see optical signatures of the vial nodes in the uh, linear con connectivity measurements. And now this is looking at just the, the linear component, right? So this is um, chi 1. I'll also talk to you about the, the chi 2 and predicting chi 2 and chi 3 processes in these systems. And we thought this was interesting because you could also use this as a diagnostic of finding new valve semi-metals. So there's an exciting uh, prediction out there that many, 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 uh, including from uh, Ashwin, that there are uh, many, many um, materials out there that, are, um, that, that host valve nodes. And what would be great is if we had a simple diagnostic, you could say, OK, all I have to do is stick my sample under this robotic system, and, and it'll tell me where the nodes are. It'll tell me whether or not this is interesting from a, a valve perspective or not. And as we were doing this, we realized that actually um, it's, it's not quite that straightforward. And electron-phonon scattering comes back to, to haunt us. In particular, 
in looking at the linear optical responsiveness, and this is uh, with one of my collaborators at uh, Boston College, Ken Birch, um, well, we start to see that there is a very strong uh, interference between the, the, the electronic and the phonon spectra in these systems, and you start to see these phenol line shifts, and you see these consistently in all the type 1 glass metals. metal. So you see this in tenol marcinide, you see this in niobium marcinide, but you don't see this strong signature in type 2 glass metals. We thought this was interesting because I just finished telling you that some of the type 2 glass metals we studied, the transport behavior was almost entirely electron phonon dominated, and I'm telling you that the optical physics here Type 1 is electron phonon dominated, but not of type 2. So that was exciting to us, and we started to characterize this and see what the phonon dynamics in these systems looks like. And this is ongoing work, um, but this is actually where we, we really start to see that including phonon effects um, up to second and third order is essential to predict uh, the dynamics in these systems. One quick comment. Uh, another thing that we, we evaluated about these valid semi-metals, and this is... Uh, um, after some conversations with Chen Wei Fan at uh, Stanford, we realized that you can use volatile semi-metals for non-reciprocal radiation control. Okay, so uh, if you look at the, the linear optical response of this, so you look at the epsilon tensor, for most things, the off-diagonal terms go to zero, okay, which means that my absorption and emission are exactly the same. They're just, they're reciprocal, okay? But if those off-diagonal components don't go to zero, I, I can actually think about uh, changing um, the, the, uh, either the absorption or the emission. So essentially, light traveling forward and backward through a uh, non-reciprocal material doesn't look the same, which means I can have one-way propagation. So people do this. They usually have to apply a magnetic field for, for this to occur. Um, but it turns out that <coughs> these um, off-diagonal terms uh, don't go to zero without an applied field. Uh, this could allow you to do some uh, really interesting uh, nanophotonic devices. So these thermodynamic quantities to think about uh, either emission or absorption are almost entirely uh, determined by uh, this epsilon tensor. So we're computing this, and uh, we got excited, and we thought, well, maybe tenol or niobium arsenide could be used. Uh, it turns out in, everything is not quite that, that clean, so time reversal is not, not broken here, so we don't see much in the way of non-reciprocity uh, in the type 1 valve semi-metals, but there are magnetic valve semi-metals. In the time that we started evaluating this, uh, people experimentally demonstrated uh, valve semi-metals that uh, are magnetic without an applied magnetic field, and uh, we're, we're now looking at some of their optical properties. With that, um, I'll just stop here, and happy to take questions. And for those of you who don't want to ask me a question here, are you welcome to stop by my office. I'm in Pierce 3 to 4. So the uh, interesting transport properties, the APC, <clears throat> connected at all to the topological properties of lots and networks, or is it just an accident? Um, that's a really uh, interesting question. We see some signatures of the valve nodes show up in the transport, but that doesn't seem to dominate that electron phonon uh, term that now we're implicating in transport. Having said that, I have not found another non valve system that exhibits all of the same properties. So we're hoping that the, the diagnostic we're seeing where the life signs across the family surface <coughs> change, that we'll find which of the states, and hopefully they'll be related to the. Um, the ball physics in these systems. But yes, that's uh, going into this, the, the hypothesis was that everything is about the fact that these are about semi-metals, and now I think I'd say I'm not quite so sure. Um, I think that the Vitamin France law of violation, in, in particular the fact that we've had to invoke these higher order phonon processes, is most certainly related to uh, the fact that these are about semi-metals. Okay. But I I can't say that for sure. What I'm trying to say is I don't see some interesting uh, internode scattering that dominates everything or, it, or cancels something out. Those were kind of the signatures I was looking for uh, when we were initially competing these systems. Yeah. Um, do we actually understand what the electron phonon hybridized is? No. Um, turns out you can write down a viscosity for the electronic uh, conductivity, and, and you can say, okay, well, I've had electron, purely electron hydrodynamics. This is what it looks like. Um, actually, phonon hydrodynamics is the inverse of that. So the things that should be mo momentum conserving become momentum relaxing and vice versa. So I don't actually know what an electron phonon fluid and then how, how you would write down a hydrodynamic equation for that. Um, but I suspect that part of that answer will co come from doing a couple BTE calculation that 
uh, one of my colleagues in the audience is, is working on. Uh, we suspect that uh, doing, uh, I know, we, we're, we're making things like increasingly more challenging, but we think that doing a couple BT calculation with uh, the VALT semi-metals will be, uh, with Avenue Shift scattering matrices will be the way to go. You're looking at me like that's, that's a bad idea. Well, no, I was just thinking it would be better to have the equations first and then figure out the transfer equations. Um, yeah, I, I'm just not sure how to parameterize uh, the hydrodynamic equations using electron funnel fluid, but maybe I'm missing something. So I'm happy to talk about that. Such a thing should exist. Any other questions?